There is no God. That might as well be what people say. As you look at the news and turn on the news there and you hear, whether it be local or the national news or around the world, that might, cause it might as well be what people say because that's how they live. You think of how can pe- people do that, especially when so many people claim to believe in God in America and yet you have all these murders and thefts and all these things going on. And you, you watch whether, if, whether it be like a 20, uh, some of these Friday night and Saturdays at 2020s and 48 hours and Dateline where they investigate different stories and these crimes. And, and some of these people who have been found guilty, they, they like, yeah, I, they, you find they went to church and they believed in God and all these things, but yet their life didn't show that. And that's really what is, because it's really what is called practical atheism. Because there's two types of athe- atheism. One is where a person who is downright, outright denies that there is a God. And the Bible said, and we know what God's Word says, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. Practical atheism says there is a God, but the person lives as if there isn't a God, as if there is no justice. They do not, they live as if God does does not see them, or God doesn't know about what they do, so it's as if God is not omniscient. It would be a denial of his omniscience, it would be a denial of his sovereignty, that, he, there is, that God will not, he's not going to punish me. And that's what we find a lot of, that people live as if they, they acknowledge God, that there is a God, but they live as if there is no God. And that's what is the heart of, the, this is a good part of the psalm, is that the wicked person who is being described here is, pro, is most likely a practical atheist. And the psalmist is probably discouraged, and ask God, why do you stand far off? You seem distant, God. Why, why do the wicked, or why are they allowed to, to live like this? And we see that every day. We hear the news that people that, like Bernie Madoff, who had made off with billions of people's money, who gets, who gets a little bit of time. He doesn't get a lot of time, and he, he isn't going to be paying back all that money. But yet we see if somebody goes and robs a store with gunpoint and maybe gets $100, gets life, even if they didn't pull a trigger just because they had a gun, but yet somebody can, with a pen, steals more money. We see that kind of wickedness go on. We see people who has scams people. They prey on those with dementia and Alzheimer's the people who are in their right mind, and they scam them out of money. I know at least two people that were taken for hundreds of thousands of dollars, preyed upon. When they were younger, they would have done no such thing. But yet, we look around and we wonder, where is God at times? Why does God seem distant? Why doesn't God... Why does God allow the wicked to be like this? Why doesn't God do anything? And we've got to be careful because we don't want to become pra- practical atheists. Live, you know, we acknowledge God on Sundays, but the rest of the week, that we don't acknowledge Him at all. We don't consider our ways. We don't live for God's glory. And so we've got to be careful. And we've got to be careful as well because we know that God is in control. We know that God is omniscient. He knows all those things. But we know that God, He is ruling. He has a day set when He will punish the wicked. And He has a reason and He has a purpose. And it's not because He's indifferent to sin. 
We know that we have to go to his word, that he is that he is in control. That we have to go to what God's word says, that he hates sin. But from our viewpoint, there does seem to be times in our life where God seems distant. And why is that? Why does God seem to be far off? Why does, as in Psalm 10, verse 1, why, does, why is that the experience? Because this isn't the only psalm that speaks of that. But he says, why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? The psalmist here is perplexed. This might be David that is writing. It was once thought that Psalm 9 and 10 formed a unit. And so it would be possibly David. And so perplexed, why, God, are you afar off? From his perspective, it seems that the Lord is standing far off, that God is hiding himself, that God is not answering prayers, that God seems indifferent. It appears that God is no longer a present help in times of need, that he doesn't appear to be a refuge, as Psalm 46 one says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in t- trouble. At this time, it appears that God is a mountain that cannot be climbed. He appears to be a fortress that you cannot go into. The refuge in which the the doors are barred. They're not open. The psalmist feels this way because his prayers have gone probably unanswered. Even though he says, why you stand far off, O Lord? He used the name Yahweh, the great I Am, the name that speaks of God who is, not in de- who is not dependent upon anyone, one who is self-existent, the great I Am. But the God at the same time, that very name is present to help those who call upon him. And so this is the psalmist's experience. This is the way he feels right now. God, you're far off. Where are you, God? Have you ever felt that way about God? That he seemed to be distant? That is your prayers really making a difference? Are they, is he hearing your prayers? Is your prayers even effective, as James speaks of, of the righteous man? The prayers of a righteous man avail of much. Do you, have you felt that way? Have you had that experience? And there's different reasons for that. First and foremost, sin can do that. And this is, not the exper- this is not the experience of the psalmist that we know of. It doesn't speak of sin in the, in the entire psalm. But we do know sin can do that. Sin can break fellowship with God. It doesn't break our relationship with God because once we are forgiven, we are eternally secure and there's no condemnation to the believer, to those who believe. But we do know that in an experience that 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light as he himself is in light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. So walking in the light is walking in godliness and righteousness, but if we're not, but walking in darkness and walking in sin, we don't have fellowship with the Lord at that time. Sin breaks that fellowship, and it's going to make God feel distant. But we know the truths of verse 9 in the same chapter of 1 John. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so sin can do that. And so the response is to be confess that sin and fellowship is restored. But sin is not the only reason. The cares of this world can do that. We can become distracted by the cares and responsibilities of this world and our duties and forget who really is important. Jobs can distract us. Home repairs can distract us. Sports can distract us. Family can distract us. There's different things that can distract us. And so the cares and responsibilities of this world can make God feel distant 
And so the remedy for that is that we have to go back to who our first love. We must go back to God and make the thing, the cares and responsibilities, those things secondary, and he is primary. Third, it's because you have not read his word or, and or neglected the prey. He could feel distant because we're not reading God's word. We're neglecting to pray. And so we must go to his word and read and meditate and go to him in prayer. Fourth is looking at the prosperity of the wicked. It can make seem God distant. And this is going to be part of the experience, if this is David writing this or another psalmist, of, and I'll look at that more in detail, but looking at how the wicked are prospering how they seem like their life is stable, that they have it all together, and nothing can happen to them. Nothing can go wrong. Well, we know that is not true. And then during trials in life, there are times that God appears to be distant. And this is more so upon our feelings, that he may appear to withdraw or appear to hide his presence, but it's more of our subjective feelings rather than the objective truth of Scripture. And this is really a common experience. I mean, the Psalms are full of that. Psalm 22, 1 and 2. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance of the words of my groaning. Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. Psalm 13, 1 and 2. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? How long will my enemy exalt it over me? This is probably the experience of a lot of believers of one that is the more common, along with as well as sin, as being trials that when God appears to be distant, I feel that he is distant. I feel that his presence is hidden like a cloud, how the cloud hides the sun, how his smiling, his smile and is being hid behind that cloud. But understand this, that God has not abandoned you if you're a Christian. He never, he, I, I should say, he has promised that he will never leave nor forsake his people. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. But make sure your character is free from the love of money. Being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we will confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Well, we know that God doesn't lie. He's the God of truth. So he says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And, we're, and the Holy Spirit is, is presence alone. And the Holy Spirit is constant with us. That we are sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. We have that Holy Spirit. He is not going to take away. And so he never will leave us nor forsake us. And so he cannot lie. He is the God of truth. But he does allow trials to appear that way to us. And there's purposes for that. I'll get to a few moments. But we have to go by God's truth. We're walking by faith, not by what we see. We walk by faith in what we know God's word says to be true and what his character is. We draw near to him in reading of his word. And we pray to him. Whether it be by our trials, our needs, or... Or praise, prayer or praise, we draw near to him. And we trust him during the trial. And it's, it's easier said than done. But we must put our trust in God and God alone, knowing that he works all things out together for good. We trust him during those things. We trust that he is in control. We trust in that he is sovereign. We trust in that he is he, omniscient and he is all wise. He knows what he's doing. 
And while trusting, we live for His glory every day. We grow in our sanctification by reading His Word and walk in the truth, live in a godly life, and we draw close to Him, trusting Him. And don't use a trial as an excuse to sin, because that's going to be the temptation. God doesn't care about me. He's distant, so it doesn't really matter what I do. Those are, that's the enemy. And so you, you, you have two choices. You're either going to trust God and what He has promised His word and trust in His character, or you're going to trust in yourself and the lies of the enemy. Because you're going to trust in something or someone. But understand that this is only for a time. These trials are un, that are common for believers, they're only temporary. And even discouragement and depression in a trial will make God feel distant. Because, but it's our feelings, rather, which are subjective, and which we must go by the objective truth of who God is in His Word. We understand He's working all things together for good. Understanding that He's not concerned about your happiness, but your Christ-likeness. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 7. Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials, so the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, being though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That here's trials here, that, that your faith, the proof of your faith, be more precious than gold. If we found a result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Christ. And so behind what appears to be a frowning face is the, the God of love. It's a God who does care. A God who's working all things together for good. That is making us more into Christ's likeness. John MacArthur says this. As one of God's children, you are, you are promised His presence. Though now, for now, you feel alone and without help. Rest in knowing God, your Father, has good reasons for bringing you into your trial. He is committed to making you holy even if it means taking away your happiness for a time. You will derive benefit from your trial, not by ignoring it or fainting under its weight, but by understanding its purpose. When you realize God is using the trial to make you aware of His grace in your life and fit you for eternal glory, praise, and honor, you will be equipped to endure it, even though it brings you in distress and heaviness of soul. And so there are these six, six ways we can respond. And this has been adapted from MacArthur and his website. That suffering, as, he, as they put it, suffering, is, suffering makes you more obedient. You learn obedience to the Lord that first, in Psalm, not first Psalms, but Psalm. 119.67, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Learn obedience to God. You learn, uh, you learn that there's corruption in your heart as well. You can learn that. You forsake sin and learn obedience and learning, trusting God through trials. And then also these things. Suffering deepens your insight into God's word. Psalm 119.71, it was Psalm 119.71. 
It was good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. Deep into your understanding of God. Deep into your trust. Third, it increases your compassion, effectiveness in ministry. 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. He uses trials that you may comfort others who are, who, who are going through what you had been through before. And it, so that's how it affects your ministry, because we are to minister to one another. We're to be help one another, be concerned about one another. We're not to look on our own interests, but to look on the interests of others. To be concerned, and so it deepens that effectiveness and your compassion for people. That you be concerned and care for others. And so when you go through a trial, and whether it's disease, can't, I mean, cancer is common. That whether you uh, have a loved one with Alzheimer dementia, you can minister to somebody who is themselves, that they're going, that their spouse, their friend, a family member that they know has, is going through that, or any trial, any disease, whether it be long-term or short-term, the compassion and effectiveness that you minister to others teaches you as well to wait patiently on God. Psalm 27, 14. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Isaiah 40, 28-31. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous, young men stumble badly. Yet those who wait patiently for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. So it teaches us to wait on God, to wait on Him. And waiting on the Lord is not doing nothing. That's not waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord means you wait for Him to come and help for what you're going through. But you do what you're supposed to be doing. You are drawing close to Him in, in His Word. That you are praying to God. That you're trusting God. You're living a godly life. Those are things that you do as you wait upon the Lord. But also, trials and suffering makes your joy less dependent on circumstances. That's one of the things you learn. That your happiness and joy are not to be based on whether something goes your way or not. Because those things are temporal. Things will not go your way. You're not in control. And we learn that, and our joy is dependent upon God, not circumstances. And this is Habakkuk's experience in 16 and 19 of chapter 3. I heard, and my inward parts trembled. At the sound, my lips quivered. Decay entered my bones. And in my place, I trembled because I must wait quietly for the day of distress, for the people to arise who will invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there will be no fruit in the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there will be no cattle in stalls. And so he's, he's talking about that he is waiting. He has ministered to people and calling them repentance. Not listening, and God's judgment is coming. And so he knows the horrors are coming. But he says this, Yet I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he has made my feet like hinds feet. It makes me walk on high, my high places. And for the choir director on my stringed instruments. You know, I think of also not just deer. He talks about the feet. The stability is what that speaks of. I think even our feet 
are like those mountain goats that you ever seen them that climb on these small crevices. I mean, you wonder how in the world can that goat, that animal, be on those little crevices on these high mountains, on these cliff walls. How do they get there and how can they stand there? Well, for us, the same way stability. Stability in the Lord. Our joy comes from God and God alone, not in circumstances. And then sixth as well, we learn from suffering. It makes you appreciate God all the more when He restores you. I mean, think of Job when God... This isn't going to be an experience of every believer where you get double of what you lost. But when God restores it, appreciate, you appreciate God all the more. And you appreciate the gifts He has given. And then now, here. And so these are reasons why God appears distant, but He really isn't. And we so must trust Him and what we learn from suffering. And we have greater light than, the New Testament shines greater light than what the psalmist had. That here, God's revelation, as each book is written, we increase in understanding. We increase in more light. And, and so we have more understanding than, than they did, even though they know many of the things that and I've said they know God was omniscient. They know He's always present. But here's their experience. And His experience is that he, keeping this mind, He says, Why do you stand off, far off, Lord? He goes into verse 2. When He speaks about that, when He goes in verse 2, He says, In pride the wick, wicked hotly pursue the afflicted. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. The reason why the psalmist here feels God was distant because part of that was the wicked in their ways. They appear to prosper. They appear to be stable and safe. They use power to destroy the innocent to get what they want. And it appears that God is silent. That God's not going to judge that. That there is no justice. There are those even as in this that use religion. Because some of these are probably Israelites using religion to further the evil. They are the practical atheists I spoke of. But we must look at what they, what they really are and what their end is, the way, their way leads to death. But the psalmist goes through different characteristics. And we're going to look at the first characteristic today of their pride, their arrogance. You would think of, here the psalmist describes their pride, and you think, why doesn't God just strike them down right there? I mean, the pride, looking back at verse 2, in pride the wicked hotly pursue the afflicted. Let them be caught in the plots which they had devised. That word for wicked can mean, refer to the ungodly, the unsaved in general. Speaking of everyone who is lost. And that's a true statement. But here, the context is speaking of the worst of the unsaved, the worst of the wicked, the people, these people in their worst activities. And so wicked hotly pursue the afflicted. They're hotly pursuing them. They're trying to overtake them. In pride, they pursue them. This in, the, the, here, this intensifies in describing the afflictions, that they, the suffering that they put upon their victims. And they're proud about this. They're proud about hurting and harming and doing evil. No remorse. There are people, even today, they're caught red-handed. They're taken before a judge and found guilty. But they have no remorse. They don't care about the, the, the lives that they have destroyed. Whether it be through murder, they don't affect, care about the families they affected of the victim, and they don't care about their parents as well. But what they've done, that here their parents have to, are suffering because here, their son, their daughter has done the, this stuff. And they, or even if you talk about stealing, they're thieves or whatever they do. 
they don't care. They're, they In pride, they plan, and they pursue intensely, and they take joy and happiness in that. The psalmist says, let them be caught in the plots where they're devised. There's two ways to take this. Either this is referring to the wicked, as in that them, let them, as in this is the wicked, that anticipating they'll be caught in their own plans, just as the previous psalms that David had written about, that the, God's going to turn things over the, on their head, that whatever they devise, that God's going to turn that against them. And that's a true statement. But there are times when the when afflicted, when the victims are caught first in the plans of the wicked, before God turns it around and does to the, these evildoers. And most likely this refers to the victims being overtaken in the plans of the wicked, furthering the lament and crying out of the psalmist as he cries out to God. Because from the psalmist's perspective, it appears that God is not defending the innocent. But, uh, but he is protecting, in a sense, that from appearances, that he is he's allowing this to happen. And the prophets, you, speak, that you have that, Lord, your eyes are too pure to look upon evil. And then he says, why, Lord, do you allow these, why do you allow the evil to do these things? And so this is a common experience in life. Verse 3, the wicked boast of his heart's desire, and the greedy man curses and spurns the Lord. I mean, this man, this person boasts they get what they want. It appears that whatever he desires, that he can get no matter what in life. Not only does the wicked boast about achieving his evil desires, he blesses thieves and curses God. Because this is, and the reason I say this is because of the, the verse can be translated this way. The thief doesn't have to be someone who breaks into home. The thief can be someone like Bernie Madoff, who ruins the investments of others, who scans people, and walks away with billions, walking away rich for a time. The thief is ruthless and clever. It could be the person who calls people on the phone or emails them and takes advantage of people with their schemes. They commit fraud. It could be the mechanic who charges too much or fakes a repair. It could be the contractor who runs off with money. The doctor who commits for insurance fraud and Medicare fraud. And these are just a few, few examples. There's many more that could be listed. But in the context, it seems that it's that here they're speaking of that they praise the wicked. The wicked praise thieves. They have the praise to take advantage of those who take advantage of others. And they, so they praise those who steal because they get away with it and they had the cleverness to take advantage of people and they curse God. That word for revile or spurns in, in the American standard it speaks of, it, it, descri it not only describes as speaking evil, but it's of hatred and contempt, contempt for God. It is rebellion. They hate God. And the reason they hate God is because He condemns such actions and will punish those who do th just such things. That is the reality we come back to. God will punish, but everything is in His timing. A false balance of Proverbs 11.1 1 is an abomination of the Lord. But a just weight is his delight. Back then you did a lot of weighing of things. And so you would have these weights and you would, pro you would weigh out silver and gold and other things. But some people would make their, depending on what they're doing, if they're trying to, to rip you off, they, you know, somebody may make their weights, you know, heavier so that it appears that something weighs this much and other people might la make they may make things lighter depending on what it is so that they get more than what it's supposed to be instead of getting 10 pounds or something they may get 15 or 12 or something they get more enough so it doesn't look like it's 
noticeable, but God notices. And so this is it's a form of stealing, but God hates all forms of stealing. It's an abomination to him. The further the description of their pride, they give no thought to God. In verse 4, the wicked in their haughtiness of his countenance does not seek him. All his thoughts are there is no God. His pride and arrogance is what haughtiness is. On his face, he has a proud look. Those Proverbs speak of that God hates a proud look. And this person, they give no thought to what God says. They have no thought in their life of what, if they're walking in the ways of God, they're a practical atheist. They may go to, as, and then they go to the, the temple and worship. And they give lip service to God, uh, as God spoke of. And he spoke of that their, their lips, he, he talks about their lips, pray, you know, the summit, I mean, to summarize it. You know, their lips are praising God. They speak, bless God, praise God. We give you thanks, O God. But the heart is far from him. They keep their heart from Him. They do not walk in the ways of God. They give no thought as if they're living for the glory of God. They give no thought if I am living a godly life and this is what honors the Lord. Give no thought of anything of that. And so on one hand, they think that they think of there's no God. And on the other, they're thinking that God doesn't care and He's not going to punish me. God's, God's not a God of justice. He's, I'm, I'm getting away. And so they think they can get away in these things. And that's how he's living. That's how they're living. When the truth is, in Matthew 13, 41 through 42, the Son of Man will send forth his angels and they will gather out his kingdom, all, out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those commit lawlessness and throw them into the furnace of fire and the place that will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. They're, you know, that it's going to come on them suddenly. Everything's going to come collapsing down upon them. Revelation 20, 10 through 15, this is their way. This is their end. And the devil will deceive them was thrown in like a fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from him whose presence earth and heaven fled away. And no place is found for them. And I saw the dead, the great, and the small standing before the throne. The books and books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the dead, from the things which were written in the books, according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown in the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So that's their way. That is the end of, their, of what's going to happen. It's going to come suddenly, and they're unprepared. They are building upon, as another parable Jesus spoke of, on a house upon sand that will collapse, and great will it be its fall. And so it will take them by surprise and suddenly. And we must not live like that. We must be humble. James 4, 6, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So we must be humility. We must be humble before God, not proud, but humble before God. Humility, you know, part of, part of that is thinking about others, considering others, but also it's really not thinking of ourselves. We don't think of, we don't look out for number one. We live for God's glory. And then you consider your ways to please the Lord. You live for God's glory. Am I, am, am I, in what I'm doing, am, do my words please God? Do my desires please God? Do my thoughts please God? Do my actions please God? Does this line up with Scripture? Proverbs 3, 5, and 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Verse 6, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. You know, acknowledge him. In everything you do, acknowledge God. Live for God's glory. Take thought of God. Do not be a practical atheist coming here on Sunday 
and the rest of the week taking no thought of anything that happens. That, do, that don't think about, do my words please God? Does, does my life honor the Lord? And so we can't live like the wicked. We must live for God's glory and we must trust Him through trials there. That though it may appear that He's distant, He is not. We must trust Him. And we walk by faith until that dark cloud disappears. We trust the Lord. We walk by faith, not by our sight.